Good evening. I'm Christine Hurley, director of the speaker series at the Institute of Politics. We're pleased to welcome Senator Shelley Moore Capito to campus this evening, and we look forward to her conversation with David Axelrod. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, some upcoming events with the IOP on Thursday, November 29th. We're hosting Alex Wagner uh, to discuss her new book, Future Face, which uh, explores race, identity, and belonging. And on Monday, May, th May sorry, <laughs> December 3rd, uh, we're hosting Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative for a conversation on his work uh, with the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial to Peace and Justice. You can find out more about these events and all of our upcoming programs at politics.uchicago.edu. Um, as usual, we'll open up the floor to audience questions. Uh, the first three are gonna come from our students. We're gonna have a microphone in the center aisle, so just line up when it is time. Um, if you hear anything during the conversation that piques your interest, write it down, type it up on your phone. It's okay to bring notes to the microphone. Um, now's a good time to make sure your phones are on silent. If you need to, restrooms are downstairs. And then here to formally introduce our speaker is Evita Duffy. Evita is a first year from Hayward, Wisconsin, uh, and she's a board member of College Republicans. Please join me in welcoming Evita to the podium. Senator Shelley Moore Capito has been serving West Virginia in the United States Senate since 2014. She is the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate in the history of West Virginia. Prior to her election to the Senate, she served in the House of Representatives for 14 years. Before that, she was a member of the West Virginia House of Delegates. Senator Capito serves the Senate Appropriations Committee, the Commerce, Science, and Transportation Committee, and chairs the Subcommittee on Clean Air and Nuclear Safety. Senator Capito has spent her career reaching across the aisle, becoming the third most bipartisan senator of the current Senate. She is the member of the Republican Main Street Partnership, a group that focuses on centrist goals in Congress. She's respected both by Democrats and Republicans as someone who can be counted on to bring people together in these increasingly polarized times. Senator Capito's commitment to truth, justice, rule of law, and due process has been an inspiration to many Americans her distinguished career is especially inspiring to the many young conservative women, like myself, who admire her strength, intelligence, and love of freedom. David Axelrod is a political consultant and analyst, most notably as a senior strategist for Barack Obama's presidential campaigns. After Obama's election, Axelrod was appointed senior advisor to the president. He currently serves as a director of our own Institute of Politics here at the University of Chicago, and is a senior political commentator for CNN. As a college Republican, I want to extend a personal thank you to you, David Axelrod, for your commitment in preserving and protecting political diversity at the University of Chicago. Please join me in welcoming Senator Shelley Moore Capito and David Axelrod. Thank you so much. Senator, welcome. Thank you. Uh, sorry about the Chicago weather. It's we're fine. Happy, we're happy it's to have winter, you. you know? um, before we talk about the here and now, I, I just want to talk a little bit about your life because you're a second generation right. politician. Your yeah. dad was a legendary politician mm -hmm. in West Virginia. He was. He was a governor and a member of Congress. Um, what, what did you learn about politics mm -hmm. growing up in your, in your home? Well, first of all, thank you, David, for having me here, and thank all of you for being here. Uh, I learned a lot from both of my parents uh, growing up in a political family from the time uh, I was born until when my dad exited pol uh, politics in 1989. It was a campaign every two to four years. It was parades. It was, it was dinners. Back then, it was a lot of moving around hand-to-hand, uh, -hand, face to face and you know, I really liked it. I, I, I was interested in the issues of the day. Uh, I always, you know, I did. My other siblings sometimes would bucket going, but I would always say, "Yeah, let's go." So I would, I would always enjoyed, and probably a lot of that was being with my parents because if you didn't go with your parents on these things, you never got to see them. But I, what, what my biggest takeaway? I have a couple really, but from my dad later on after he left public service and. And he had a great career, but he had some bumps in the road as well. And he, he, the impact that he had on people, not in large senses, but in smaller senses. Like, 
my brother was in Vietnam. We hadn't heard from him for a week. Your dad was our congressman. My mother called and found out through your dad. And the next day, she picks up the phone, and my brother's calling from Vietnam. I mean, things that he was able to do to make impacts on singular families or singular communities, baseball lights on the field, uh, paving a road, um, really made an impression on me, I guess, wanting to help people. I, I'm from a small state of West Virginia that has vast challenges and making it a better place. And so I learned that you could really make impacts uh, almost every day. And, and what about uh, just the, at the art of politics? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, did you, what did you learn about that that has served yeah. you uh, now as a, a practicing politician? He, my father was infamous, infamous for an incredible memory for people's names. And you know that nothing makes people feel better than when you're in, and more useful when you're campaigning than if you can say, oh, Dave, hi, yeah, I saw you last week. You've got the gas station on the, on the corner. He was very, I mean, even, even yesterday, my grandson was baptized, and he's named for my father, and one of the elder members of the church came up and said, I hope he has a memory like your dad. So it was legendary memory. But what that meant was he cared about that person. Um, the other thing he told me was... So is that, do you, do you have that I'm not as gift? good as him, but I'm fairly good. David, by Don. <laughs> oh, just kidding. Okay. The other thing he told me when I was first running, because I was nervous, I think, was in his terminology, if you'll just excuse the terminology, he goes, show the pearly whites, Shelly. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, honey, you got to smile more. People want to see you smile. And, uh, and so as you're going to be looking at me for a, an hour. I'm going to be smiling. Uh, that was something that, you know, that kind of warmth that, that brought him in. And he, the other thing that he taught me was um, every person is the same in his, in his mind. If it's the President of the United States or Walter who brought him his iced tea in the middle of the day, they were equally as important to him. And he I'm, not sure, I'm not sure the President would accept that. <laughs> yeah. But he would, he would treat everybody equally and spend as much time on that on Walter as he might on somebody else. And mm -hmm. those, I think, are really good political traits, and I, I've tried to emulate them. So we just had uh, an election uh, this week. Mm -hmm. This week? I know. Yes. It, or was it last No, it was six days ago. Oh, six days ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I'm still recovering. Um, <laughs> tell me how you uh, interpreted those elections. I think it was pretty much what I expected uh, in terms of the losses in the House. Um, they weren't as large as had been predicted in terms of the Democrats taking over. But they also um, could have been smaller. Uh, some of the districts that turned over probably could have been better positioned for Republicans. Biggest group of uh, the biggest Democratic crop since Watergate. Right. So it's significant, very significant. But I think, you know, historically, I was there uh, in 2010 when the House flipped uh, under President. I know. Yeah, I was there. You fondly too. remember that? Yes. yes. I remember that. <laughs> Don't you yes. like me for bringing that up? No, I still have a foot, <laughs> footprints on my back yeah. there. Yeah. And, uh, but you know, it's funny. It's, it's <coughs> funny the things you forget because I'm thinking, was that predicted? I think it was predicted, but it ended up to be pretty big uh, in 2010. 63 as it was. seats. Yeah. I always joke about this, though, because. Um, Roosevelt lost 78 in uh, 38, so I said we did better than Roosevelt. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. That, was, that didn't get that boot off your head, though, did it? <laughs> no, no, it did <laughs> no, not. No, it did not. So I, I think in, this, in the Senate, uh, in terms of the races, the Republicans had a very favorable map, probably what they say, the most favorable Based map. In a century. Since, yeah. In a century, uh, lost one seat and picked up uh, at least, I think, two or three, and then maybe another one in Florida. That still remains to be seen. Uh, so I think that's, a, that's a, a major win there for Senator McConnell and the president uh, to hold the seats and then also to pick up some of the seats. Not as many seats as maybe some thought could be picked up, but it certainly was a pick up. Anything in the plus column was going to be good. In your, uh, your state, voted for Donald Trump by 42 points. Right. Uh, and yet Joe Manchin, right. who is a Democratic senator, mm -hmm. won re-election. Right. Were you surprised by that? I wasn't surprised. I live in Charleston, West Virginia. I've known Joe Manchin since 1976. Our fathers went to college together, 
this is typical small state. And uh, when I was first married, uh, Joe was working for his father's carpet uh, company, and my dad called his dad and said, Shelly needs some more carpet, and guess who came and measured my carpet? <laughs> Joe Manchin. So that's the first time I met him. Uh, and we are, we are good friends. Uh, we're you know on the different teams uh, politically, but we do work really well together. And Joe was a governor that, a very hands-on, you talk, when I talked about my dad being very personable and hands-on, that's the way Manchin was, and in the end it paid off for him. He was able to come overcome what looked like a pretty dramatic shift in our uh, um, political thought in the state. Well, if you lay everybody's carpet, you're going to make a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. uh, but uh, what interested me about that race was having gone through the 2010 experience when Republicans really ran against the Affordable Care mm -hmm. Act and to great effect, uh, Joe Manchin, in the state that Donald Trump won by 42 points, really ran on the Affordable Care Act. He may not have said it was the Affordable Care Act, but he ran on the health care. And there conditions. And, and there's a reason for it, because West Virginia has been a big beneficiary of that. Were you um, surprised by the power of that issue in West Virginia? N uh, not really. I wasn't. I thought it was, um, uh, you know, in talking with him and others, uh, when you poll issues, as you know, you poll issues and anything, what is it, anything you get over 60 is considered good. This was polling way up into the uh, uh, late 70s, 80 percent in our state on pre-existing conditions. We have an older, less healthy state. And so health care is a big issue. Uh, and so I wasn't surprised that it hit uh, it, it hit as well as it did for him. He also had the advantage of his opponent, uh, Patrick Morsey, who is our attorney general, was one of the lead attorney generals on the case that was becoming the question in Texas. So we had that too. Um, in, and in we other also words, had the, the case to eliminate. Yes, to whether, say whether states had to keep the individual mandate. Right. I mean, because we because and, we got rid of the individual mandate, whether that meant you had to keep a pre-existing mandate. Right. Yeah. And Patrick Morrissey was one of the primary attorney generals on that, so that was like a double whammy uh, against against him. And you know, Manchin wrote it out. He's good at uh, staying on message, and he did. Yeah. Do you uh, now? Now I think that uh, West Virginia, about twenty nine percent of your population is on Medicaid. Right. Is that right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and. The uninsured dropped from 21 to 9 or something under mm -hmm. the Affordable Care Act. You, you mentioned you're on the other team. You must have felt sort of buggy-whipped by this issue uh, because was, your party position was to mm -hmm. repeal the Affordable mm -hmm. Care Act, but you had all these beneficiaries in your state. Right. The expanded Medicaid portion of Obamacare was really the... Um, the difficult issue for me when we started to look at repeal and replace, because you have 180,000 new people on expanded Medicaid. We, we have a, dr a drug problem in our state, a major drug problem. Much of the access uh, in that population to mental health and drug uh, care was through me expanded Medicaid. Uh, so that presented great challenges for me uh, when we were discussing this. And I brought it forward, if you go back and look yeah, and, 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 and see where I was on the thing, I'm like, okay, I, I, I can go with repeal and replace, but we got to replace this. This is what concerned me. There was no replacement out there. And quite frankly, in the political environment uh, that we're, we're in and we find ourselves in, um, that was a bit of a trust walk to say repeal, re repeal with no, with no real replacement in front of you to see what kind of impacts it has. It's not a dead issue. I think that we're going to probably still be looking at um, block granting. The states, a lot of people don't like that. It depends on how it impacts your state. Um, but I think we in can do words, some you reforms. Get, you get, you'll get money uh, mm -hmm. in a block grant rather than per capita mm -hmm. people who are Medicaid. Right, and then the get. state can can massage how they want to use it a little bit more. There's a lot more flexibility in that. And I think there's some pluses to that, but again, it's got some minuses attached to it. It was obviously- People fear that it's a backdoor way to actually cut funding. 
Well, they think that or cut certain parts of uh, Medicaid that are popular. But you know, at the same time, there are parts of Medicaid, for instance, transportation issues. You can, you can go from Charleston, West Virginia, and have Medicaid pay your, if your doctor, you know, if you choose a doctor in Parkersburg, which is 70 miles away, Medicaid will pay your transportation. You know, you gotta get some, a little bit more guardrails on here to, to make sure that um, we're spending our dollars wisely. And so I think that's the conversation we should be having now. Some other states expanded Medicaid in their uh, election. I think three, one was- Yes, Idaho, for, Nebraska, and Utah. I mean, we're talking about red states? We sure are. Yeah. And what does that tell you? That tells me that those states have decided that it's probably uh, going to stay, expanded Medicaid is going to stay, and we're leaving money on the table that these other states are getting. Yeah, and so it's do you sizable. anticipate the other states will? I don't know, like Texas is a huge state that doesn't have it. Yeah. But uh, some other states have, more, have better economics to be able to address the issues for this population. We're just not one of them. Um, so was when you ultimately, well, first of all, why, why wasn't there a replacement? Because we couldn't settle on the replacement because we had uh, a certain amount of us in the Medicaid expanded states that were very concerned about what's going to happen to this population and we couldn't settle on what that, what that answer was going to be. And if we had gone with repeal and replace but keep expanded Medicaid, we probably could have gone there. But then, that, then we lose some people on the right, who, who are more on further on the right, that don't want, that didn't want that. So in the end, it was a remarkable evening because it appeared as though Senator McCain was going to vote for it. And then, as the as the night progressed, and then in walks Vice President Pence, and um, I mean, he's trying to work over McCain. McCain, as we all know, is not really work overable. And uh, it was it was. I've had a couple historic moments. That would be one in the Senate. Let me ask you about that moment, because it occurred to me looking at the polling and the exit polls in particular from, uh, from last Tuesday, uh, the number one issue on people's minds uh, that they said led them to vote was health care by a significant margin, mm -hmm. I think by 15 points. I think immigration may have been uh, next. Uh, and the people who voted on the health care issue, 75 percent voted for Democrats, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering what whether John McCain may not have saved you guys from a larger disaster by voting no on that. Well, you could look at it the other way. Had he voted yes, uh, and had we replaced, and had we had a system put in that doesn't have rising premiums that are going out, uh, you know, people dropping off of plans because they can't afford it, all these things, you could look at it that way. Uh, so I, I guess I would prefer to look at it that way. <laughs> Okay, we'll let you look at okay. it that way. Okay, okay. Um, <laughs> Thanks for that. Uh, um, you, you mentioned that you had a, a, a drug crisis in yes. your state. Mm -hmm. I mean, West Virginia has been deeply, deeply impacted by the opioid right. crisis. I think there was one town, Williamson, mm -hmm. where over the last decade, like 20 million right. Pill. opioid pills mm -hmm. were delivered to two pharmacies mm -hmm. four blocks apart, and the town's like 2,100 people right. or something. Right, right. So uh, tell, me, tell me through your eyes, why has what West happened? Virginia so bad, been so badly uh, affected by this? A um, couple of reasons, I yeah. think. Um, first of all, um, we have an older, um, more, more manufacturing-based um, economy, so there's more workplace injuries. So the need to have some issue, some issue addressed through pain medication may be a little greater in our state than uh, in some other states or other areas. Um, our coal miners lost all their jobs uh, in, uh, in a period of time, and it was uh, the helplessness of losing your job and uh, idleness and uh, a really uh, pessimistic feeling of um, that has existed in, in Williamson is in, in deep in coal country, um, I think co contributed heavily to this. And then people get hooked, and it just is a repeating cycle. If you've ever read Dreamland, yes, uh, it that's where I live. And how 
how do you process that as a public official? Well, you must be looking at tragedy after tragedy. Well, when you know uh, people and their kids and their families who have, have gone through this, uh, who have lost their loved ones, I mean, uh, these are these are young people that have parents that loved them and tried and did everything. That it's not the stereotypical uh, somebody who was had a crappy life and was living on the street and turned to drugs because it was nothing else. These are people, uh, a lot of them uh, fully advantaged in their lives, or at least some, a lot of advantages, and um, no answers. We didn't have any answers. It crept up on us so fast. Um, I, I question where was the pharmacy board, where were the, where were the uh, safety measures in place to find out how drugs were getting um, prescribed? Why didn't we know that this pharmacy in 2006, 7, and 8 was dispensing millions of pills in a town, another town of Gilbert, which was 800 people? Uh, so I, that makes me mad, you know, because obviously um, it became a business of uh, hooking people. And then once we, once we um, uh, squeezed down on the pharmacies, then the heroin epidemic uh, came, and then fentanyl came after that. And then now it's methamphetamine, a different type of methamphetamine than the stuff that you cook on, uh, you know, on your stove. It's a, a synthetic methamphetamine that's very lethal. So it's, it's made a big impression on us. We lost uh, over 1,000 people last year in a small state. We are the one, we are the one state that has the highest mortality uh, per population. And, and do you think you're making any progress? Yes. Yes, here's a, uh, you know, I, I use Huntington, West Virginia as an example. It's where Marshall University is. Uh, it, uh, it had uh, a, an incident of 28 overdoses in a four hour period. Um, two people died, 26 people lived. Um, but Huntington decided as a community, it has to be a community-based re uh, result. Huntington decided, uh, and I think they're going to be the leader in this, they developed more treatment, they developed alternative treatments for um, infants who are exposed to drugs, the um, NAS babies, um, and it's an alternative site outside the hospital. They've got a Marshall University Medical School that's doing research on it. They have a remarkable crisis response teams. Uh, here again, you probably think does all she do is watch TV, but if you see the, um, uh, there's a uh, independent film out there called Heroin. Uh, I see somebody nodding their head. It's, it's excellent. It talks about Huntington, West Virginia. It talks about three women, that's heroin, and what they're doing to address the, the uh, it actually was nominated for an Oscar. Uh, but it didn't win, but they made quite an impression. You know, I should have mentioned earlier when we were talking about the health care issue that you were a big supporter of the children's children's right. health insurance yeah. plan uh, in Congress. And um, that actually bought you some problems when you ran for the Senate. It did. Uh, because you were accused by the right of being mm -hmm. a big government liberal disguised <laughs> as a conservative. Right. Well, I mean, I look at it as uh, if we can get our children healthy, and uh, healthier, anything we can do to get them healthier. They're gonna be more productive adults, they're gonna get a better education, they're gonna perform, uh, and, and uh, you know, if you look at it from a purely economic standpoint, it's money well spent in the early years to, to try to ensure a healthier adult and be aware of, um, of their own health. Uh, so I, I've never had a problem with that. At one point in the House, I was like one of only five Republicans. Joanne Emerson was another one. From Missouri. A good friend of mine, yeah, that w voted. Anytime there's an expansion of children's health insurance, I was, I was it, it covered a lot for our children. Um, it still does. Speaking of health, uh, can we talk about coal? Sure. Um, because there is this, there is this tug and pull between the economy of your state, uh, which is rely has been a coal-based mm -hmm. economy for a long time. Right. As you point out, that that those coal jobs have been vanishing for a long time. Mm -hmm. The president campaigned heavily. Uh, on this issue, so there's there's that on that side, and then there's the issue of health and of course climate uh, on the other. And you you've stood up steadfastly for the industry mm -hmm. uh, in your state, but are you concerned about the the 
kind of deleterious effects uh, of coal? You know, I'm always going to do, I'm always going to be, my first major in college was pre-med. I thought I was going to be a doctor. So I always think maybe this is why I, healthcare is something that I naturally am attracted to in terms of policy. So I'm always going to be concerned about whatever is, is deemed to be uh, causing um, any kind of health effects. I'm very happy that the FDA uh, has taken it upon themselves to get rid of these things called jewels, which are these nicotine things that kids are buying, and I'm looking at the young people. You, you guys know what I'm talking about. Okay, please tell me you know what I'm talking about. But anyway, I mean, they're down into the junior high where they're taking them out of their pocket mm -hmm. and getting a little from. But anyway, it's unhealthy. And so, you know, just last week, the FDA, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in favor of that. So coal. Coal's difficult in our state. We've had, we were the biggest coal producer until Wyoming decided they had 30-foot seams, which we do not have. I will give a plug for our coal. It's the highest BTU. It's the, uh, it's the, most, um, it's the most sought after coal in the, in the world because it's called metallurgic coal, which you use not to generate power so much, but to make steel. And, and so it's, it's very valuable. It's, it's the most valuable coal. Coal definitely has its challenges. We as a state made a mistake, put a lot of our eggs in one basket for too many years on coal. Um, we did have development of natural gas in the northern panhandle where we have um, the Marcellus Shale. So you've got, you've got natural gas rising. You've got coal um, at, when I first went in, at about 50% power generation. And quite honestly, a president came in and decided he wanted to get rid of coal. And uh, he just ripped through our it's state. It's about the president I work for. No, it wouldn't be that one. But uh, <laughs> it really, here, here if, you, if you'll allow me this, the, the big objection I had as the, as, the Paul, as the West Virginian in the room was it was a dramatic, it was like a dump off the side of a 100-foot cliff. Like, we don't care. We don't care about you. We don't care about your jobs. We think your job's dirty. It's, it's, we don't need it anymore. I know we needed it for the last 100 years, but we don't want it anymore. And so, too bad, you're done. And that's what happened. And we lost tens of thousands of jobs. I know that the, the, the coal base employment was going down, but it really, if you look at the statistics, really went down. Our state finances, our county finances, our school finances, everything. And then we started losing a bunch of people. Senator, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to get off that. that. Debate the point of, <laughs> of uh, but it's also true that nat we, there was an explosion of natural right. gas. You're not supposed during to say that period. Right, right. Yeah, that I did that one time. Somebody said, "Don't say explosion right of natural gas." Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Lesson learned. Yeah. Uh, but but, uh, but there was a. There were other market forces. Yeah, there yeah. were there were market forces, yeah. and were, were, regardless of who the president was. Coal was going to take a hit because natural gas was right. so much cheaper. Right, but we weren't going to get dropped off a 100-foot cliff. In any event, back to the climate change. Yes. Um, so what I think the future of coal is, is research and development. I'm on a bill with Sheldon Whitehouse. There is no person more anti-coal than Sheldon Whitehouse in the U.S. Senate and more pro-climate change uh, uh, well, anti-climate change. Yeah. Or anti, oh, yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Pro talk about climate change, anti-climate change. Right, you got me. I got you, you got me back. Um, anti-climate change. But anyway, we decided. You heard the other night, Nancy Pelosi say, no one's stronger for pre-existing conditions. <laughs> and it's like some guy on the CNN said, said let's hear it for type 2 diabetes. <laughs> it's like, anyway, go ahead. So, yeah, sometimes we don't really phrase things like we want. Right. So anyway. Um, we, we came with, uh, Heidi Heidkamp was on this bill, Barrasso, me, and uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, and we actually got it in the tax bill, and it's a tax uh, advantage to those companies that um, use carbon sequestration, utilization, or sequestration. Now, it can't be used commercially quite yet because um, the in, uh, economics of it are still challenging, but it's starting to drive some of the um, technologies. So that's taking carbon out of the air, and that's good for... Uh, for climate change, and uh, and or I bad think we, for climate change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm getting mixed up here, yeah. but uh, you know what I mean. Yes, I uh, do. Yeah. So you know, I think research and development, uh, and uh, if we can find a way to store renewables, then that will be another. 
move in that direction. Store the energy from renewables. Yeah. But here's the, here's the issue. Uh, for the last five years are the hottest on, uh, on record. Uh -huh. And we've seen these really dramatic climate, climatological events, forest fires, uh, really violent storms and so on. And now we see th this report that just came out in the last right. few weeks saying that we're, we're, we're about at the end here, mm -hmm. that we're really at a, a line of, you talk about being dropped off of a 100-foot cliff. And it's a kind of an irreversible uh, situation. How do we, is the answer for the economy of your state to, um, to continue to, to try and nurse the uh, coal industry along, or is it to develop new industries oh. uh, for your state? Oh, yeah, it's definitely B. I mean, yeah, we're going to have a steady base of, of uh, coal that's going to be producing power of probably 30% until we, we come up with some uh, way to store the energy from renewables right. But, you know, natural gas is a carbon emitter as well. Uh, but a less, less of a less, carbon. but still. I mean, yeah. if you're if you're looking at everything, our nuclear base is uh, dwindling, uh, closing nuclear plants around the country. That's got undesirable uh, effects as well, which is on the storage side. Um, you know, the the rods and everything, the nuclear rods, and and so <coughs> nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect. And uh, what we're trying to do in our state is reposition ourselves into uh, a a better high tech. We're trying to develop curriculums around cybersecurity, which is, you know, a growing, um, a growing field. Uh, we're also looking at um, advanced manufacturing in terms of because we do have so much natural gas. Natural gas is an ingredient in chemicals and plastics and all of that. So we are definitely in a transitional phase. We are no longer like we were probably 20 years ago going, we're going to fight this to the death. But we're going to fight to sustain what I think makes sense in terms of coal, which is a production for metallurgical coal. And uh, it's hard to get coal now out of uh, West Virginia. Who's been in a coal mine here, in an underground coal mine? Yeah. It's Someone at a... Pardon? <laughs> at the museum? It's not the same, I can tell you. It's tough work. It's tough work. Yeah, without, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. and. You know, the thing about these new industries is that the people who are, you know, you often hear when, about the changes in the economy that the, the new economy is producing new jobs, better jobs, and so on, but not necessarily for the people who've lost them. Right, and that's a hard transition to make. Yeah. Uh, but there are, you know, agriculture holds some, some promise. Um, you know, we got a shortage of welders, we got a shortage of truck drivers, these are uh, electricians. So you can transition a little bit. The problem is a lot of people don't want to move. They don't want to leave their family home and all those kinds of things. And, uh, but we are transitioning in the state. We definitely you, you, are. You do accept the notion that there is climate change yeah. and that, cli and that people man is it. contributing yes. to it. And that but I don't think West Virginia is causing it. Not, al not alone. I mean, let's look at the globe here. Yeah, no, understood. But coal does. Coal, coal is most, uh, I, I don't know if there are scientists here, but they would tell you, they would say coal is a, a major pollutant. In well, I think there's all kinds of major pollutants, yeah. But I mean, I wouldn't dispute that coal's part of it. So let's talk about the president, because I think he'd insist. Okay. He would insist. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you, you know, back in the campaign, you met with him uh, after he was going to be the nominee. Right. Um, tell me if I'm wrong. OK. I'm, I'm just going off of, of what I read. And uh, you, you, you said that you told him uh, that tone is important. I did. I think I got a quote here from you. a real impression. <laughs> so when, I, uh, when I talk about tone, that's what I'm uh, you said, uh, you, prior to the meeting, she said, I'm just going to emphasize what you say and how you say it is really important. Right. I'm concerned about the tone and how it's going to influence his, uh, his campaign. Uh, when I talk about tone, that's what I'm talking about. I don't think it's exclusive to how he talks about women. But he, And then you went on from there. And you also said there are a lot of independents. There's a lot of Democrats in those states. You have, to swing vote. You have swing voters, and they swing from independents over to Republican. 
in this election, independents voted 12% mm -hmm. in favor of Democrats. The president had won them with, by 4% last time. I think Republicans had won them in double digits uh, four years ago in the midterm. Um, are, are you concerned that your admonitions, A, haven't been heeded, we can stipulate that, mm -hmm. and B, that they are ha they're making it tougher for Democrat, uh, for Republicans who don't necessarily live in states where Donald Trump won by 42 points. Right. Well, I think that's, um, I think tone does matter. Um, probably the reason that most of you sitting in this room have never really don't know who I am and don't see me, even though I've been in public life now for 20 years on my own, is because I strike a, I think, a reasonable tone. I'm not on any TV station saying, anything that's inflammatory. I'd rather just put my head down and do my work. I work bipartisan all the time. And I think I get results. And that's how I prefer to do business. I actually, you know how, well, you probably don't, but I put my um, name into Google Alerts so that anything that comes up I, that somebody's writing or saying about me, I can see what it is. And it was something about these quotes. And I thought, well, I've got a famous quote. That's, <laughs> I'm great, I got a famous quote. And my quote is, it, it, was, it was interesting, it was about being nice. And I said, I don't think being nice means being weak. I think you can gain strength from being nice and gain consensus. And it doesn't mean that, you, you know, that you're not strong. And uh, I thought about it when I read that, and I thought, wow, that's pretty good, Shelley. But, I, um, <laughs> but in all seriousness, I believe that to be true, and that's the way I conduct I prefer to conduct myself. But I think it's, we've, we're now in an age where, uh, uh, and, 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 pos and driven by the president, but I think it was there before. It's just magnified of um, a 24-hour news cycle, I believe, uh, contributes to it, and this instantaneous social media where you can just throw stuff up, and, and uh, sometimes anonymously. Uh, but in, in, in I do believe that, um, uh, getting things done uh, across the aisle is you're going to be have better luck if you have a smoother tone. I think it's going to be interesting to see where the president goes uh, with the House being Democrat, because we know he really, I think, in a lot of ways, is not a traditional Republican, <laughs> yeah. and he has some other, uh, you know, for instance, his trade and tariffs would be more of how the Democrats would. Or it used to be. Yeah, used to be. And, um, but I mean, I look at like Sherrod Brown, who's next next mm -hmm. door uh, to to me in Ohio, big union. You know, he was very much an anti-trade kind of. Well, I, I don't want to characterize him like that, but he was definitely agreeing with the president's position on this. Um, so I think it's going to be interesting to see how he works. You think he might he cut some work. deals with the Democrats? I do. And in terms of the tonality, if he wants to get something done, which I think that's what he wants. And how will you in the Senate uh, react to that? You know, if it's, I, I think. If we, we're still going to have to what pull Democrats. What kind of Democrats. issues are you thinking about? Oh, I mean, infrastructure is one that everybody talks about. Uh, it's something, it's a, it's a need across the, across the globe, I mean, across the country. Um, and so the question is going to be how are you going to pay for it? So let's say we get over that major hurdle there. Uh, could we really strike a deal? I think we could, uh, and I would, it would give some, everybody something to run on, but it would give the president something to run on, and I'm not sure that... Uh, if you're the leadership in the House, that you really want to give the president something to run on. I, I don't know. You know how that goes. I mean, mm -hmm. and just the final word on this. And if you have questions, please line up uh, behind this this uh, microphone here. Um, uh, on this question of tonality, how many mornings do you wake up and watch the news or look at your phone and oh, say, every now, "Why did he? Why did he have oh, to say that?" that? Um, yeah, I was going to say, how many mornings do you wake up and look at your phone? Every morning I wake up and look at my phone, which I think is a little on the <laughs> weird side. Um, but we're all doing it, I guess. Yes. Um, what's really bad is when you go to sleep and then you wake up in the middle of the night and your husband's on his phone. <laughs> You're like, what are you doing? Yes. But uh, <laughs> for those of you who've been married a long time, it's not something yes, we're used my, to. My wife would attest to that. <laughs> yeah. So... Um, uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a part of me that's probably become numb to some of it. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. But, you know, you got to figure out how to get through the day and, and take the good. I'm a very optimistic, 
happy, looking forward person all the time. That's the way I am. So I'm going to take from, from what he's saying as much good as I can get. And, and I guess if, if he's flying something up there that I think is uh, very destructive, uh, I, I would make a public statement about it. But in some cases, I might just go, well, let's see what happens in the next and, and in fairness to you, you do come from a state that he carried by 42 yeah. points. You're on the ballot again in two years. He'll be on the ballot again in two right. years. You're probably not looking for fights with him. No, I'm not. But uh, Well, let's see if these guys can inflame one. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> my name is Adam. I'm a Hi, second Adam. year from Iowa City, Iowa. Um, my question is about the Affordable Care Act. Uh -huh. You've expressed that you uh, support for Medicaid expansion and coverage for pre-existing conditions. At the same time, you voted to repeal the individual mandate, which is going to take healthy people out of these risk pools and increase premiums further. And you voted for a tax bill, which McConnell has said he wants to pay for by cutting Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. So I guess what's the Republican plan that's going to decrease premiums without spending more money? Well, the individual mandate I look at differently. I feel like I I've, I've never figured, I understand that's to get people in to the pool, but you're penalizing people with hundreds of dollars on the lower end and more than that uh, if you don't buy something. And I had a problem with that. If you need health care and, and you want it, you know, you should be able to have access to it and it should be affordable. And, and, um, and you shouldn't have a mandate on you that tells you that that's how, why you have to do it. Uh, and so I, I don't really see that as, be, as having a, uh, the devastating effect to uh, our system as, uh, as some people see it. Now, our premiums in West Virginia this year, after double digits and double digits and double digits, I mean, up into the 25s and 30% on the exchange, went up 8% this year. So that tells me, um, of course, getting rid of the individual mandate hasn't kicked in yet, but something's going better than it was. And it could be that they jacked the price up so much that you know, now it's settling back down into a, to a region. But there's things we could work on that would really help with affordability, like prescription drugs. If you talk to anybody in a company who's got businesses, that, and you talk about what's driving the cost of your health care, it's pretty much and the majority of people saying the high cost of prescription drugs. And if you have somebody who's on a really high drug, high cost drug, it's really uh, very, very costly. So that's um, um, how I would address the, the, other, the question. I, I, you said I'd voted for a CAPS bill. Is that the budget? The, the tax bill. Tax oh, the bill. tax bill. Now, how are you figuring that's cutting Social Security? What he's Medicare saying is that Mitch McConnell said because of the large deficits well, that you yeah. may need to vote to cut Social Security and Medicare. Yeah, I, I, I've been running since 2018, and every person who's run against me says she wants to cut Social Security and Medicare, and we haven't cut it once. It's not going to happen. We're going to have to reform. Now, you could say, oh, you're just using words. It's the same thing. No, I'm not, because... If we take it... You're getting way ahead of everybody. Here. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I've, been, I've been through a few campaigns myself. <laughs> you can do both parts. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, sorry. Is that obnoxious? No, no, sorry. no, not at all. Sorry about that. Not at all, not at all. Um, but you could take your generation, say, and do something in the long term that will bend the curve on Medicare. But it's so hard to do politically. You've got to do it together. We, Republicans can't carry this, and the Democrats can't either. We have to, we're going to have to make some systemic changes, and the worst time to make it is when your back's up against the wall. Just like if you have your credit card maxed out and you need $50 to buy your driver's license, you, know, you're, you could end up making a bad decision uh, to get that $50. And that's where I'm afraid if we don't get the courage, but I don't see us doing it in the next two years. A lot of people were concerned about, uh, including budget analysts, that this tax bill would add significantly yeah. the deficits, and they have. W were you concerned about that? I was concerned about that, but when we looked at the analysis we looked at, that, that the assurances were from people that I have a lot of respect from who study this a lot, particularly like a Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania who's very deep into this, is that the increased GDP growth would 
would turn that down. It hasn't happened. Uh, and that's the first question I'm going to ask him when I see him on Tuesday. Yes, you should. Because we got that report. You should ask him to go through that again. I will ask him to go yeah. through that again. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Sam. I'm a, I'm a second year from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I was just wondering, so you talk about West Virginia, a lot of people losing jobs, um, and a lot of programs you have to try to combat that and to get people jobs and trades and other things. But then there's a problem that you're trying to get people to move for jobs, which isn't always possible. I don't know. There's been some talk of like a kind of trade-off between that, between you want people to move for, for, for jobs, but you don't want to just like depopulate all of America's no. small towns. You want people to move to prosperity, but you don't want them to like leave West Virginia, and then um, you don't want all the rest of left West Virginia to be left behind. Right. So I'm wondering how you balance like the helping the state versus helping the individual people in the state and all those sorts of things when you're talking about retraining and building up new industries for people to work in. I think that, that that's a that's a difficult question, but I think where I look at it is is you got to have the infrastructure to keep people. And in rural America, there's a digital divide. Fifty six percent of my state can't get high speed internet. So how am I going to tell you guys to come and you got a good idea and you're going to sell over the internet or you're going to be you know have architectural drawings that you're going to send when you can't even upload anything? So I think we could do and we are doing a lot there. Um, to, to equalize the digital divide, to make these rural areas so that you can insource jobs in the rural area. I've found companies that want to come to West Virginia for their tech support, or not even their support, for their software engineers, because they're in northern Virginia where people get picked off all the time and you got to pay more and more wages. Whereas if you went to West Virginia and found uh, probably near where the universities are, you're going to find young people that are software engineers that want to have the nice where you can go down and run the rapids, you know, 15 minutes outside your house, and the great things about living in rural America or living in my state. And uh, so I think companies are really beginning to look at rural America to, as a solution to some of their high cost problems, but you gotta have the infrastructure. So that's one of the areas that I've really been working on. My plan's called the Capito Connect Plan. How do you like it? <laughs> that's good. It's a good one. Thank that's you. Good. Thank you for that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thank you. How are you doing, Senator? Good. Uh, my name is Julian, and I'm a first-year student. Um, yeah, so I had a question. Judging from your hat, not from West Virginia. Not from West Virginia, no. <laughs> is there anybody from West Virginia here? Oh. All right, next questioner. Yes. <laughs> um, so my question was, um, so Republicans have long stood for the idea of phys fiscal responsibility. Uh -huh. Whether they've actually put that into practice is a different thing. That's true. Um, so a lot, yeah, you see in the midterms, a lot of progressives have been running on the idea of um, health care, universal health care, health care for all. Um, and with um, a couple months ago, the Mercatus Institute released a report that said it would cost $32 trillion, and that was conservative estimate for universal health care. So do you think that is at all a sustainable idea? And do you think, um, obviously, I, yeah, so do you think it's a sustainable idea no. in the future? And how do you think maybe conservatives can combat the idea of universal health care? Because obviously it seems very enticing. It's, you know, if everybody's going to be able to get it, and you don't want anybody to be left uninsured. I Whoever have, thought the guy in the Yankees cap would yeah. serve you up that pitch? Yeah, that's a no. Uh, <laughs> I can stop there if I think it's sustainable. But I think uh, the concept of obviously everybody being served is something I think we all would like to see yeah. and, and want to see. Um, but I haven't seen any anybody really. Well, some people ran on it, but it was mostly ur the urban and, and Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. and and it's just it's. I don't see a, a concept that's sustainable at all. Hmm. And uh, obviously, we're all young people, and you see um, studies show that like 50% plus of young people support the idea of health, um, universal health care. So, mm -hmm. what would kind of be your message to, uh, uh, against maybe in practical terms why that wouldn't be viable? Well, I think that the best way to get more people insured, particularly off of the public insurance issues like Medicaid, Medicare, and in my state, PEIA, which is the state insurance, which are traditional underpayers. I mean, our hospitals, their payer mix, their private insurance payer mix is 18%. So it's no wonder everything's going up so much for those folks that, so the best thing is to get more people employed, more people, companies growing, so that the, the availability of insurance in that sector, we did open up, um, some, they did open up association health plans where if you're associated around the country, and there's criticisms on all this. There's also one on some shorter term uh, health insurance plans. 
So if you don't want to buy for a year, you can buy for six months as a gap. So I just think we need to be more creative on how to fill these gaps. We, we have 3.7% unemployment now, so the economists would say full uh, right. employment, and it varies from state to state, obviously. Uh, but is it really smart to tie? I mean, we made this bargain in World War II to tie health insurance to employment. Mm -hmm. We're really the only major industrial country that does that. Is that... Is that smart? Well, you know, it may end up that we tie it to the individual. That's one of the concepts out there where you, um, you have portability in your plan. In other words, if you have a plan or you get a plan through your company, you can take it to the next company and all that. I'm sure you've heard that concept. Yeah. Maybe that's, you know, a better solution. I just haven't seen the solution that uh, is out there that is solving, you know, this very, very important issue, and obviously it's important to the voters. Hi, David. Hi, Senator. Hello. Um, I'm Andrea. I grew up in Moundsville, West Virginia. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's right where I was born. My dad was from Moundsville. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember your dad being governor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, my question is about um, the change that uh, that I've seen in home um, now when I go back. Um, in West Virginia, my, my dad was a coal miner. Um, mm -hmm. It was a, a solidly blue state for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, my house was a democratic house and pro-union. Um, but that changed at some point. And given your long record or your long public service, um, can you talk about why you think that happened, when you think that happened? Mm -hmm. Like, were there specific events that maybe triggered that. Sure. Yeah. Well, so do you, are you in school now here? I'm, uh, I work on staff here and I'm at the oh, Graham School. Good. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So I'm from Glendale, which is a suburb of Moundsville <laughs> and Brad Paisley's from Glendale, right. everybody. Yeah. So we're, we're very proud of our Brad Paisley, aren't we? Um, I think it began to turn in 2000. Uh, that was the first year that I ran. It was Al Gore versus George Bush. Uh, a new a uh, presidential candidate, a non-incumbent had not won, a non-incumbent Republican had not won the state of West Virginia since the 20s. Now, Reagan had won the state, but he was on his reelect. Nixon won the state, he was on his reelect. But a non-incumbent Republican had not won the state of West Virginia until 2000. And I think what caused that, well, I mean, Karl Rove wrote a book on it, I think. Uh, on how, what was the name of that book he wrote? It was, uh, but anyways, how he kept telling George W. Bush, you gotta go to West Virginia, and Bush is like, West Virginia, it's solidly Democrat, there's no way, they're, they're never gonna vote for me, never, you know, in this first, um, and, and Karl Rove ended up right, and part of the problem was Al Gore with his environmental issues and his gun issues, you know, it's rural America, really, I think, caused that, that's my theory, caused that to turn in 2000. And I only won by one point in 2000. And I'm certain that, and, and really it was five electoral votes, and that's, you know, Florida takes credit for, for uh, electing President Bush, but really if they hadn't had the five West Virginia, uh, Al Gore would have been president. So I think that's where it started. And then it was 10 years later, I was the only elected Republican for 10 more years. And then uh, another, David McKinley came in from the northern part of the state where you, where you're from, and then in 14, all we, all four, there were four out of four out of the five federal office holders uh, were Republican, and the state House of Delegates and the state Senate flipped for the first time since 1928. So it really started in 2000, and it took that long to go, but it it's a dramatic shift in the 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 uh, majorities in the House and Senate, the state House and Senate, have stayed. And I think what took it away was I, I think the, Democrat, the traditional West Virginia Democrat Party, which was the Union Democrat Party, was uh, you know, interested in preserving uh, workers' rights and um, you know, making sure everybody was working, and they felt like their party had left them. Um, and um, it reflected in the vote. Let me, let me ask you a sensitive question, but how much uh, do you think involved race Oh, and, none. Okay. Well, that's a... I really don't. And maybe I'm being overprotective of my state. Could, Could be. be. But I really don't. Uh, all right. Well, then let me move on to guns. Um, we're, sitting, we're sitting here uh, just 
a mile from, or, or several miles from, well, close to communities that are really uh, battling gun violence mm -hmm. on, a, on a daily right. basis. And we've seen these, we just mm -hmm. saw another horrendous shooting right. incident in uh, California. Uh, overwhelmingly, people, Americans, and I presume some of them in West Virginia think there are certain ideas like universal background checks that might be helpful that we should do, and yet nothing ever happens. Uh, how, how should people process that, I mean, and the unresponsiveness uh, well, we did, we did in the, I don't know which bill it was, it might have been the tax bill, pass some uh, tightening of the background checks. Um, it was about a year ago um, around uh, reporting requirements and things of that nature. Interestingly, all the background checks, the NICS, it's called the NICS system, is all done in uh, West Virginia at the FBI Robert C. Bird earmark. Uh, we have the. Uh, we have so why not give them more business? You know <laughs> oh, I mean? they're getting a lot of business. Hmm. Believe me, they're getting a lot. They've really um, increased their employment uh, there a lot. So uh, I think it is. Uh, it is a uh, gun rights in a state like mine, and I know it's hard to understand in in an urban area, are very deeply held. It's not about holding the gun in your hand. It's about the right to have the gun. And um, I think the mental health, that's what we tightened up, was part of the mental health. I should have brushed up on this because I figured you'd ask me about guns. Uh, we, we tightened up some of the mental health issues uh, on reporting requirements for guns. I mean, I don't, I, I think there's probably more things that we could and should do, but we never quite get there. And uh, it's a very divisive issue. Uh, and it divides rural and urban, it divides Republicans and some Democrats, although, you know, I, th I think some of the Democrats that ran this last time were pro were pro gun Democrats and won. So um, these these big tragedies are just horrifying, horrifying. And I don't I didn't see the latest on how this latest guy how he got his gun. I, I, he bought it legally. He bought it legally. I mean, the question but, is, should he have been able to buy it, given a history that he had? But, um, I mean, it is, a, it is difficult because as vehemently as people feel about their gun rights here, there are heartbroken parents here who, yeah. who are worried about their child's right to get through the day without being shot. No doubt, and go to school without being shot. Yeah. I mean, that's just... Um, so, I mean, you know, we've tried to help schools with school safety. I mean, I've visited four or five schools over the last several weeks in terms of um, entrance to the school. Like when my kids were in school, I could go in the back door and just walk down the hall. If, I, if one of them forgot their books, I know, it's over-mothering. But, you know, if they forgot their book, I might go in the back of the school and, you know, leave it in their locker. Uh, you know, you can't do that anymore, thank goodness. Um, mm -hmm. Probably teach my kids more responsibility at the time, but um, there's. I, I think there's there's going to be more discussion. I just don't know where. It's a just a very difficult issue. Yes. Hi, my name is Sanjeev. I'm a current medical student here. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about President Trump's appointment of Acting Attorney General Whitaker. Mm -hmm. Would you, if you were to nominate him to be the permanent attorney general, would you vote for him? And how do you feel about whether he should recuse himself from overseeing Mueller's investigation, mm -hmm. especially with some of the comments he's made about it being a witch hunt? And, you know, I think he made those comments about a year ago in an editorial. So I guess it's a three part. Last part, promise, is who would you like him to pick? Well, I for can't that answer spot? that because I, I really. I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. Okay. I don't know on who, who to pick. Um, <laughs> I saw where the president said he hadn't met Whitaker, but then he says he really knows Whitaker. Yeah. So I'm not going to say I haven't met him because then he's <laughs> going to find a picture of me with him and, uh, and say, yes, you do, yes, you do. But I don't believe I've had the opportunity to meet him. So the first thing I would do if he was appointed would be have him come in and talk to me because that's what you should do as a responsible senator and because you have the opportunity to do that. Um, so I, I don't know, um, you know, I've seen his public comments. Uh, they obviously ra raise a red flag. I think I voted um, 
I think we had one vote where to protect the Mueller investigation. I voted yes on that. Um, I am, I'm going to say I'm frustrated it's been, it's been going on for so long. I mean, at some point, when is it going to end, I guess, is what, what I would say. I mean, is it going to end at its natural conclusion, which is what you would hope. But at some point, it's got to reach a natural, a natu a natural conclusion. And um, I think it would be a mistake for any attorney general or the president to, to unnaturally end the investigation. Do you have a faith in Mueller? Yes. Thank you. I love those yes, no answers. <laughs> Hello, I'm Gershon Stein. I am a junior at the lab school. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could, you talked a lot about how West Virginia coal can be used for metallurgical mm -hmm. purposes. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could talk to the impending tariffs in the metal mm -hmm. area and mm -hmm. the impact on the economy of West mm -hmm. Virginia. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, you know, I didn't think that the tariffs uh, with China would really impact my state, but I did a little, while I was not having to campaign, some small business tours. Uh, the steel tariffs are, are beginning to, like I, I went to this place, Sistersville Tank Works, they use a lot of steel. Uh, they use domestic steel, but the price of domestic steel is going up as the uh, threat of, um, of uh, the tariffs are, are, are being placed. Another thing is an anomaly, whereas if, I guess if, if you manufacture something in China with steel and it comes in, there's no tariff, but you bring the steel in, there's a tariff. So there's a lot of issues around the tariffs that I think um, are troubling, are worrisome. Um, in the agriculture region, we don't have big ag, but we do. I was at a beef farmer's farm, and he, um, they export 30% of their beef to Asia, and that's, they're, they're concerned about that and what impacts it will have. Because I think they just now got the right to, to export uh, or to import export beef into China, and it hasn't really resulted in much, probably because of the uncertainty. But I believe too that China has been ripping us. Uh, the president talks about it. I think uh, there's no question uh, intellectual property in particular and the way they have our American companies doing business. It's not an even playing field. If if they're going to do this in China with our businesses, then maybe we ought to do it with their businesses. And, and we have companies that have invested, Chinese companies that have invested in our uh, um, in our state, as every state has. So the kind of semi mantra of of this is um, short term pain for long term gain with China. Uh, and I think people have been pretty patient uh, with where we're going, but you can see the automotive industry. I have a Toyota plant in West Virginia. There's a lot of concern with that. I'm sure there is with the um, aerospace industry as well. So I think the long-term pain has got to become shorter and we got to reach a resolution. So the fact that Canada and Mexico were settled, uh, I think gives some confidence to that and also puts more pressure on, on uh, a resolution. How did you feel about the president <clears throat> withdrawing from the TPP? You know, the large trade um, 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 packages uh, have been disadvantaged to a, a state like mine. Um, and so I wasn't really all cracked up about it. I mean, I, th I think that that was fine with me. If he's going to reset, that's probably a good place for him to reset. Um, I will tell you that... Um, Trade Promotion Authority, which is the uh, kind of fast track way for the president to move forward. I voted no uh, to George W. Bush, but I voted yes to give President Obama the right to do that at the very end of his term, not knowing who the president was going to be in 2016, because I thought it didn't work the first time when I said no, so let's try it another way. Um, I'm sure he appreciated it. I, he called me. <laughs> Hi, David and Senator DeCapito. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name's Angela and I'm a third year in the college. Uh, my question is, how has your background in education shaped and influenced how you govern? Mm -hmm. Well, I have a science major. I'm a zoology major from Duke. Uh, as I said, I was pre-med. And I said, my zoology major has prepared me to work in the biggest zoo in America. So <laughs> it's very much, thank you for laughing at that. That's good. Yeah. That one never wears out. But anyway, 
<laughs> my staff goes, here it comes again. Um, but in any event, having a science background has been helpful to me, really, because it's, I think it's taught me the logical thinking that sometimes legislating follows. If you can't do A, you can't do B, you can't do C. And it also helps me organize my brain into what can be a very frenzied lifestyle. And, and so I'm appreciative of my science background. I, I would say my background as a mother of three has been extremely beneficial to me um, because, uh, you know, you got to move things along in a family, and that's what you should be doing within your family of legislators. You've got you to move things along. And um, one day we were all wrapped around the axle Axel Rod. Yes. And uh, the Republicans were, and um, this was with Mitch McConnell, and uh, nobody could tell what we were going to do and what are we going to do. So I, I raised my hand and I said, This is reminding me of my three year old grandson. And, and they said, Well, what do you mean? I said, Because you asked Charlie, you know, what are you doing, Charlie? And he goes, I don't know. And it was sort of like, you know, they all laughed and they thought, Yeah, we are, we're like a little three year old kid. We don't know what we're doing. And, and so those kinds of things, it sounds really simplistic, and I, I, I hope your takeaway isn't that, you know, I'm, I, I'm making life experiences really help every little thing. And the other thing I learned early on in legislating, if you do something and you're not really sure what you're going to do, you're going to wake up tomorrow the next day, and you're going to be able to improve on it and do better and make a better decision. And, and so rather than just, um, I, there's probably been a couple of decisions that had I had to do over what, I mean, I wouldn't be human if I didn't say that. I remember they asked George W. Bush one time, it, you know, what's your biggest mistake? And he was like, oh. Yes. And I'm like, what? You can't come up with something? I mean, everybody's made a mistake. So I think my education really helped me. Uh, I'm a, a quick learner and a fast. My father taught me information is power. I gather as much power. I, I hire smart people. I look for people that support me, but also aren't afraid to tell me, mm -mm, don't do that, or yes, do that. Uh, and uh, so I also learned in graduate school, since I have counseling, since you asked me this, um, how to listen. Counseling is a lot about listening. And uh, I think being a good leader and a good decision maker is a lot about listening, too. And I think we have a lot of people that are good at talking and maybe not as good as listening. To that um, point, um, we'll now have the first, for the first time in history, 100 or more women yeah, in the great. House of Representatives. And um, the, I think the number will be about the same in terms of women in the, in the Senate. But what, what, what impact will that have, this influx of new women legislators? Well, I think if you read the studies about how women legislate and what kind of success they have, uh, women are more collaborative. In other words, we get on more other women's bills. We get on uh, more opposite party bills uh, than the men. This is actually a scientific study. I'm not just making this up. Um, we also, uh, I think, in the Senate, we have a Senate Women's Dinner. It's a bipartisan. We do. We have dinner once once a month together, where we you know, talk about whatever the issues of the day or our families or whatever it is. It's not a issue uh, thing. Mm -hmm. We're interested in getting to know one another and uh, that helps us forge compromise, I think. Um, so I think having more women is gonna be great. I mean, it, it need, we need to reflect in our diversity, in all kinds of diversity, um, our population and certainly having more women is one of them. I think when my dad was in Congress, there were like 12 women or something. I asked him, I said, Dad, do you remember where the ladies' room was when you were here? And he goes, honey, when I was here, you had to knock on the men's room door. So <laughs> he was a good guy. This is going to start uh, uh, flashing red at me in, uh, because we're out of time. But I just, I just want to finish by asking you, um, there are young people here mm -hmm. who, are, uh, who are deeply, deeply interested and passionate right. about what's going on. Uh, some of whom may be contemplating being involved in the so. public uh, square in some place. Um, what you see out there today is not necessarily all that encouraging. Right. Uh, so what do you have to say? You're obviously someone who still has uh, enthusiasm mm -hmm. for public service. Mm -hmm. um, talk about it. 
Well, I think the best way I always tell people to really find out if it's your passion is to get involved in a campaign, whether it's the county commissioner or president, city mayor, whatever, because campaigns always want young volunteers, and many of you have probably already done that. Internships in Washington, working for your, your members of Congress, or I met somebody earlier today who worked at the White House. Those are always great exposures as to um, what the thought processes are. And there's a lot of young people. Capitol Hill is covered up with young people. Uh, and it's exciting because sort of the, the juice that gets everybody going is, you know, how long is Nancy Pelosi going to last as speaker? You know, you, you go to bars and that's what people are talking about. And, uh, and so I think that's exciting. And it, it's the same thing, too, if you're city government or whatever. Um, I just refuse to be pessimistic about where we are and where we're going. I think we, it's, in, it's in our control. And if we don't like where we're going, we have a great way to change it. We just changed something. Mm -hmm. We changed in, the, in my 18 years. In my 18 years, we changed... In, in, in 2000, we changed the party of the president. In 2006, we, we changed the, the House majority. In 2008, we changed the president's party. In 2010, we changed the, We can change. And uh, that's where I think the passion of young people, because young people don't vote in as great a number as they need to. Although they um, voted this time tw twice as in yeah, that's high great. a percentage as 2014. That's great. So I would say be optimistic about we are. We, if, if you travel anywhere outside the United States, my gosh, how lucky we are to live here. I mean, I, I went to Africa for the first time, and I was, just, I was just so grateful to be an American and so grateful that I could travel so I could gain greater appreciation for what we do around the world. And uh, we are a beacon of freedom and free thought and optimism. So we, we're, I'm not too worried about it. Okay, good. I feel better. Good. I hope so. <laughs> Senator Capito, it's so good thank to you. be with you. Thank you for being here, thank and you. thank you all for your questions. <laughs>